night, guys. Awesome, here's Nathan. Hey. How are you? I'm good. You're sideways. Is that I was, <laughs> let me figure this thing out. Yay. Is this better? Yes. All right. I was, I'm so nervous. I've never done this, this I know. before. It's, it's a, um, it's like a trust fall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is cool though. Awesome. Yeah, we did it. Yeah. Happy, good stuff. Happy National Human Trafficking Awareness Day or something. Yeah. Human Day Awareness Day something. For sure. No, I'm wearing my blue. And I have my American flag hat on for the day, so well, hope you don't mind. We had, um, we had all like talked as a staff, like, yeah, wear blue tomorrow. I totally forgot today. So I, <laughs> I got really creative. I found this um, string. There you go. And, cool. Yes, I got super creative. <laughs> you are. That's awesome. I can't do a, a Instagram live for National Human Trafficking Awareness Day and not have blue <laughs> on. Oops. It looks great. It looks great. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Well, yeah, thanks for the invite. I've had um, the pleasure of uh, getting to hear Nathan a few different times over the years. And uh, this month, we just thought we kind of wanted to focus on some of the less talked about subjects that need to be talked about more as it relates to human trafficking. And so um, I wanted to ask Nathan just to just to share this is super informal and I know like so many of us are kind of coming at this from different backgrounds different knowledge levels of of what's what's going on around human trafficking so we'll try to all meet in the middle somewhere yeah. but um but yeah I mean Nathan you're a brilliant guy everything you say sometimes I'm just like writing notes even when we talked before this it was it was cool just to listen to your perspective and even some of the language that you give to things that um, I thought was really cool. And you have a background in marketing. You recently, did, was it recently graduated with your master's in public health? I graduated with my master's. I'm pending, uh, applied to my master's in public okay. health. I'm waiting on the approval if, I, if they let me in. Yeah, yeah. Doing all the school, <laughs> but you yeah. have a you have um, an incredible story as well. So anyways, just as we start, like, will you kind of tell everybody who's Nathan Earl? Um, yeah. A yeah. Bit about awesome. And thanks so much for the invitation. I, I've, I mean, I admire the work and I love when I hear you talk about the, um, the trust-based relationships. And we'll get in that, in that later. But uh, Nathan Earl, I have about 20 years of combined lived ex uh, professional and lived experience working in the field and and in the life, I got into this line of work about eight years ago. We here in South Florida operationalized a. Initially, our goal was a safe home for boys. So the the model then was, you know, we were we had the relational capital. We were going to do the outreach, identify, and then refer. That was the model. Mm -hmm. And eight years ago, you can imagine, we've quickly found out there was there wasn't anywhere to refer to. So we're like, oh man, it's something we just didn't even as somebody with lived experience didn't hadn't even thought of. So mm -hmm. that really evolved into really a three-year uh, campaign to just educate, get the word out there, who, who was willing to listen, who was movable, who wasn't, where mm -hmm. were we, um, you know, with, across different landscapes, what kind of resources were in place, what could be adapted, and the, where would we need to spend a lot of time just initially at that high-level mental models like, yo, this is happening to boys and, and males. And we had a lot of great success here in Florida, and then we, we – um, you know, we partnered with uh, some credible organizations. And so we saw a lot of impact over time with just starting the conversation, um, getting invited to speak. We started uh, finding some additional research. And then we, um, some different researchers let us know that it was our conversations and others that had spawned new research. So mm -hmm. I would say at different levels, we had different levels of success. And I would mm -hmm. say one of the, one of the, I think the hardest lessons we learned with that initial model was that we had a really responsible model. We had spent time developing a logic model. It was evidence informed, survivor informed, the systems that we were operating within and the systems that these boys were engaging with, they weren't there. So mm -hmm. and it was like, you know, we're, we feel like, I felt like we were just treading water. 
uh, within it's the school like, system. Like yeah. The autumn Foundation was like totally not there. It just the infrastructure wasn't there. And I don't think that's necessarily because people didn't people didn't care. I mean, this is an evolving, you know, an evolving yeah. form of violence. So I say all that to say we, we learned a lot. We were always willing to learn from the mistakes. Some of those were hard um, and some successes. And then four years ago, we, we adopted this collective impact model. I, uh, I call it an iteration of the traditional coalition. There's some principles of practice that make it a little different. Um, the leaders of the systems come together and you collaboratively create these strategic plans. So within that framework, we were successful at, the, at um, some, some um, macro policy initiatives around um, you know, data collection on these underserved populations within child welfare. Uh, at the local level, I, operate, I and my team operationalized um, a housing program. It wasn't a bricks and mortar, but it was a housing program for male identifying su survivors that presented with substance dependency. So when we did, we looked at the costs, you know, we could have spent X amount of dollars to invest in a safe home, if you will. Or we realized that the vast majority of the, of the, the survivors that we were engaging with and those at risk presented with some level of substance dependency. Yeah. So we looked at the landscape here in Florida, which is like a Mecca for treatment, um, you know, um, substance treatment. And must we realized, be, hmm? Must be nice. We don't have that. Oh, it's, well, it's got, you know, I'll tell you, Lindsay, there's, uh, there's some good and there's bad. So the resources are here. What happens is you have all these kids, young people coming down from the Midwest, New England, or wherever to, to treatment here. And treatment's not easy, right? And so many times they, were, they would relapse, they would get kicked out of the programs, and then it just increased the supply of a really vulnerable population here in Florida for, for later exploitation. But so drawing all of that, our model was a blended or a braided model, however, which you, you want to look at it. We, we partnered with already existing sober homes, and who were engaging with the population who had the infrastructure. And then we wrapped around and provided the training um, on human trafficking. And it was really a wraparound model with uh, a collaborative framework. And that was successful. I resigned back in February to go back to school full time and finally got one under my belt. And so now I, uh, I have the ability to um, you know, provide training and technical assistance, partners all across the country who are different levels of, you know, around, along their journey. Um, and that's exciting because um, there's one thing I will say, and finally, I'm, I kind of went off in the tangent here or, or going, but yeah, one yeah. thing, one thing we have to realize is that within the movement, I mean, we're 21 years into this formal movement, right? Since the TVPA about roughly. And so that's 20 years of an evolving of increasing the capacity uh, or building infrastructure ecosystems, sorry, that are, um, primarily initially designed for, um, for one population. We're not there yet with boys. So yes, mm -hmm. it's important to have an evidence-based individual program or a program that looks at those individual risks. But again, we've got to either put partnerships in place that we're simultaneously building, looking at the national, the policy level, the systems level work, increasing the capacity, gender bias. So there's a lot of work. And I don't think we're going to see much success if we're operating you know, independently or just at the individual level, we really need to embrace this collective impact framework to address those root causes while we're enhancing individual programs. So that's a lot of what I do these days. I love that. And so Todd, will you tell everyone a little bit about how you personally connected with this? Yeah, so I have lived experience. Um, I had, you know, if you look at the ACEs, there was a super high ACEs. Um, so the adverse child experiences and you know, there's a lot of research that, you know, the higher your ACE score, the more doses of trauma, various forms of trauma in a childhood, it um, affects your adaptive functioning, bonding, trust issues, and it can lead, the cumulative risk of all of those can lead to later exploitation and other um, uh, health consequences. So it was definitely a household, um, there's household dysfunction. If, if you're not familiar with that ACEs model, it's three domains. There's the, the abuse, the neglect, and household dysfunction. Um, so I was in um, a super conservative, it was a, a religious home. I it was a Christian home. I'll, I'll put it out there. Misguided yeah. parents, and um, there was a lot of sexual abuse and, and other things. My caregivers were sick at the time. They they were both of them had been victimized by similar sexual exploitation when they were younger, and it was normalized. And in that, in the church, were you know twenty well, God, twenty. I wish uh, forty years ago. 
Um, it was just, it was even more taboo then to talk about sexual abuse in faith communities in particular with guys. Mm. So that was one part of it um, that kind of led to those that the later risky behaviors. I started, um, my parents encouraged me to watch pornography at you know 12 and 13 to cure my gayness, mm. which exposed me to pornography at a young age. It was, I was hypersexualized and it really carved out a path to dangerous, risky sexual behaviors, the objectification of men and women. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a lot of substance dependency and alcoholism, um, 11 years old, starting 11 years old. So that combined oh. kind of created, you know, this, this pathway mm. to, uh, to later exploitation. I will tell you, and I love to share that um, school and access to education was um, really helpful for me because I realized if I could um, get into college, I would be able to escape all of that stuff. And I did, I excelled in wow. high school, um, sports, student government, and, with, and got into a really um, competitive university. The problem with all of that, and I always share, is that he had so many years of unprocessed trauma and a really powerful substance dependency mm -hmm. disorder. Um, and I, I lasted initially about a semester um, and ended this up dropping out. Yeah, this was college. Yeah, and dropped out. This was in Gainesville, so I was at the University of Florida. And um, engaging in survival sex for a place to live, for, for drugs, honestly, to meet those, those needs. And was um, in the life, beginning in Gainesville, up to Atlanta, down to Tampa, Fort Myers, was trafficked in Tampa. Um, met a drug dealer. And there was, um, there was a bond initially with some affection. I mean, guys want affection, you know, um, just like anybody else. But it, more so it was the, need, the physical needs of withdrawal. And every night that I was off the street meant less of a chance I was going to be either arrested or beaten down or sexually assaulted on the street. So, so okay, let's do it. And like any, and like if you're in this, this movement, that whole grooming process, initially it was great and nice and the needs were met. And it slowly evolved into what we would say intimate partner violence and then sexual assault. And then the, the, the trafficking scheme where I was traded, um, traded among a, um, the, drug, the drug scene. <clears throat> in that life to about 28, and uh, I was actually in a, in a Department of Corrections facility. And Mr. Hamer, my counselor at the time, I think I shared with this with, this with you before, he, he turned me on to the teachings of Viktor Frankl, Man's, yeah. Man's Search for Meaning. Such yeah. a good book. Yeah. And that was it for me because, you know, the, the faith – the faith in the Jesus stuff, I wasn't there yet. And actually that was triggering for me. So it was just another way that I believe my higher power kind of sent other humans to kind of soften my heart. But oh, and over time that worked. And I, you know, I'm a, I have a really close relationship with, with my higher power today. But um, it was a long time, man. I was 28, 28 years old. And then mm -hmm. lots and lots of therapy, continued therapy. It was not mm -hmm. easy just to get out of the life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been a struggle, you know. But, um, you know, God's been good. And, um I've been able to kind of leverage all of that stuff. I always say that it's not the, it's not the fact that people experience bad things. I mean, people experience hardships and adversity all over the planet, right? It's our response to it. And I don't know, I, I don't know if I could define like this is what that response was, but I do know that it was my relationship with this higher power. Mm. Um, and it's crazy too, because it's as functional as that religious home was when I was a kid. Um, I remember right now, I mean, I clearly remember my mom and she would always say this, um, I'm praying a hedge of protection around you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember the little, remember those little New Testaments with the, the picture of the fish and the loaves and all that the little yeah, colorful yeah. one. So I was, uh, she led me to Christ with that little, um, that little, New so I remember all of that. And again, that's why I say I was, ex I think that had a big part of my journey. Um, mm -hmm. And why I, one of the reasons why I was able to forgive my caregivers, they were sick. I mean, they were, they did you know, they were sick, but the, those, those seeds were planted. So that, and, mm -hmm. you know, a supportive network and I have an amazing relationship with my family, my niece and nephew, Naomi and Michael and Amorea. And just to really, um, I've been fortunate to come in contact with uh, really supportive people within this movement that were willing to kind of listen, like mm -hmm. to have that humility, like maybe I don't, maybe I didn't know everything. Maybe there's more to learn. And um, just this unyielding determination, like I did not crawl out of the gutter just to settle, right? And um, and I do think it's important, Lizzie, to real to acknowledge, you know, I'm a, site, a, a white cisgender Christian male, and I want to acknowledge the privilege that comes along with presenting with that, that group. 
one way I can do that is realizing that there were a lot of people, a lot of guys that I was with and trans folks and, and, and girls when I was on the street that did not get the breaks that I did. They were sent to, to jail and longer sentences and I was sent to rehab. And I, you know, I, so that's, I think, a really, I think that's what fuels or drives a lot of my passion for this is, A, just to show people that there's an amazing higher power that is just amazing and the transformative process of that, but also to kind of leverage where I am today um, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of underserved populations, not just boys and men, yeah, um, yeah. that are just, they're not being heard. Or they're just, and for different levels, different reasons, right? Um, so I, I just think it's really cool to have come from that and to have, um, to go along that journey and to be sitting across with Lindsay Speed, what? On Instagram, what? That was pretty Dude. cool. No, gosh, the pleasure's all mine. It's just like human resiliency at its finest right here, ladies and gentlemen. You know, it's just, uh, it's, it's incredible. And thanks for sharing. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's really an honor just to hear about, yeah resiliency and and it's cool even just just with what i heard you say is you know is your your higher power and also the power of relationships and yeah. and yeah. i think that that is just yeah just what our heart bleeds for over here is you know like i can write this beautiful logic model and solve everything but guess what at the end of the day if there's not healthy relationships in yeah. that sort of life we are headed downhill yeah um, and so i love that you mentioned that so why Boys, boys, males would talk to everyone, go, go down to maybe a 101 level and help people understand how boys and males, however you want to describe it, kind of um, maybe get into this life or, yeah. Sure. No, I think yeah, I always refer, I always, it's easier for me to understand and teach as well. I refer to the ecological framework and so you can map out, like there's risks associated with exploitation and forms of violence. And, you know, we talked about the adverse child experiences, mm -hmm. um, physical abuse, sexual abuse. You know, when a parent goes, is incarcerated, you, a kid experiences domestic violence, intimate partner violence, an unaddressed mental health of a parent. So when we, when we can go upstream, right, and we have some kind of an understanding of the, of the, uh, the pathways to the exploitation of others, in particular girls and women, let's go upstream to those, those, those families of origin. Boys experiences the same levels of trauma, the same doses of trauma, the same types of trauma within those households of function, right? Sexual abuse. And I would say with the disproportionate incarceration of men, black men, True. that boys and young men of color are affected by that lack of not only just the absence of a parent, but probably violence involved with the incarceration at some form, whether they were victimized or, or the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. um, and substance dependency in particular for, for this population. Um, I think in society, and I'm, I want to be, I don't want anyone to think that I'm speaking in like absolutes, because that's one thing that I, we can't, right? Yeah. But when you're looking at, you know, in society, girls are, it's okay for girls to cry and express emotion. And if it's not okay, and I don't even want to say that it's okay. Society is set up where it's more acceptable, I would mm -hmm. say, for a girl to express emotion. I want to be really careful and intentional with my language. Yeah. Um, for boys and men, it's not. And so what we find out, what the research tells us, that they internalize, boys internalize all of that trauma that they're experiencing in those families of, of, of those toxic families of origin and or families of choice in their street-based families. And so when we internalize that, many times it's, we turn to substance dependency, development of unaddressed mental health. We act out violently, and then there are a small percentage that actually perpetrate. So if we can... If we can Again, go upstream to, to see how this happens or to anyone, really. We can, it's easier for us to understand the root causes or the beginnings are the same kinds of trauma that anyone else is exposed to. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, where the nuances here are the additional barriers, A, just the lack of, the lack of inclusion, the lack of inclusion in um, many prevention programs, many outreach messaging um, just the lack of resources available, the lack of representation, but also there is these, you know, there's these, there are these constructs of masculinity and I don't use the term toxic masculinity. I say toxic norms around masculinity. Mm. So I think mass health, there is a healthy masculinity, right? Mm -hmm. um, these toxic norms though, teach boys that they're not allowed to, again, not allowed to express emotion, 
if you are victimized in any way, you're a sissy, in other words that they use that I won't hear, that you're weak, that you're less of a man, um, that you're a gay, queer, fag, all of those, those types of things. Those are, those are, that's the language that I hear in, this, in working with the population. And what's really important to realize is that if you're a, 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 you know, a teenage guy or even younger and you've experienced, and I'll use a couple of examples and say, I, I'm going through, I think I'm gay, right? Or I, I'm going through that process. I don't know what's going on. I was sexually abused at five. And by the time I'm 10, 11, I don't know what the hell's going on, right? Yeah. And we know that with this population. Um, there's these inner conflicts of, of this, this, um, this confliction between because this made me, because this happened to me, it made me gay or weak. Well, the perception of being weak on the street can mean death, murder, a beat down, isolation mm -hmm. from the only family vow that you've ever had. There are so many young people that, who identify as LGBTQ or who are going through that process that, per, that commit suicide every year in our country because they think they're gay or because they think someone else is going to think they're gay, their parents or their church. Those are, those are really powerful, both coercive mechanisms, but also barriers to disclose. Mm. Um, and so again, it's that cumulative, all of that put together creates, it just makes it harder. I mean, and when we talk about the nuances, there are definitely commonalities and vulnerability. So I don't, and I don't, I don't ever want people to think it's, you know, us versus them or them yeah. more than us. No. I think it's just, yeah, I just I think I think we just haven't had enough of these conversations um, for people to really understand. Again, we're, by and large, people don't are mainstream doesn't understand human trafficking in general, right? Yeah, right. Um, Less to talk to them about the nuances. Yeah. 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 Um, so you know, again, I think I want to I don't want to get sidetracked, but those are some of the some of the nuances. Um, the I think the forms of trauma more often than not are the same, like the name of the trauma, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the consequences can manifest differently. And then where I think it affects this population more is when it goes to the service response or intervention because no one's asking. And yeah. because no one's asking or because there are no problems, then you have males who've experienced trauma going through life for longer periods of time mm -hmm. as a whole, not you know, as a whole. Um, and so basically what you have is um you know that turns into to, to dysfunctional uh lifestyles dysfunctional life mental health substance dependency criminal which leads to criminal justice involved homelessness mm -hmm. um acting out violently poor relationships sexual dysfunction and there there are there are some credible studies that tell us that i mean it can take up to 20 25 years for a male survivor of sexualized harm to even disclose wow so by the time that person would disclose there's a lot of work to be done right um, so did that, I, th I think I answered your yeah, question. Or, good. I mean, it's just that, I mean, I like what you said about how, you know, the reality is that the questions just aren't being asked, um, enough for male, I male victims to be identified, um, yeah. even have the opportunity to disclose based on programming. Um, yeah, I mean, just we're guilty as ever of just, you know, kind of using the, the female pronoun and, you know, things like that, just because yeah. is what we see a lot, but it's, it's kind of like, I almost compare it to, you know, when we talk about the movement and the imagery in the movement and how, if we're portraying, you know, this kid with tape over their mouth and, you know, things like this, then yeah, no right. connect themselves as a victim or identify themselves as a victim because that's not what they look like, but I can almost see the same parallel with boys or, or you know males with the, like just like i don't know where to place myself because none of this you know what i mean kind of fits yeah. the story. well and it's just that lack of representation i did a lot of work in, in outreach and even for you know it's crazy even what's i have lived experience and i can check off all the boxes and i made it a point to ally myself with other groups that experienced similar things but presented differently looked differently um and that lack of representation whether you know, youth, um, young people consume media. At, at, that's the first place that they're going to find out about um, a program, media and or their peers, right? Yeah. Um, and so if the peers, you know, there's just this lack of information, so the peers aren't going to really know. And if they're looking on their phones or wherever at the bus stop or, and they see, they're not going to by and large recognize human trafficking as a, as a word, but, you know, we're, we're getting better with that. But if yeah. they're seeing the, the women and the girls and the women and the girls and the women and the girls, 
that a we're not going to the population the group is not going to resonate with that they're not going to see themselves and what that can actually do is internalize those feelings of shame and stigma that we talked about a few moments ago because oh my god this is what happened to me but then now i'm seeing this it only happens to these girls and women um and i think you know we see that at um, you know, at different levels within within research, just the the lack of gender inclusivity. <clears throat> um, you know, I work with several uh, research teams and and try to immerse myself as much as I can just to learn. A couple of things that I've learned is that you know we've been there's a there's there are gaps across the human trafficking spectrum, if you will. But um, with this population, I would say there's a, even greater gaps. We've been initially we've been looking or we were looking within victim services, advocacy, the criminal justice framework. What I found, though, is when I pivoted, there's actually a lot of research within the context of STI and HIV prevention and homelessness specific to male, <clears throat> male and um, as well as transgender and LGBTQ. Hmm. And look drawing from that data <clears throat> there's there's a lot of information there that can i think take the movement to the next level mm-hmm. everything from prevention to uh, informing our programs but one thing Lindsay, and someone asked me this at the shared hope conference like it was a credible organization i trust them and they really had the the the, the intention to serve the population better and they asked, you know, Nathan, how do we make our marketing more inclusive like who do we go to my immediate response was Oh well, you know, you need to, you know, uh, partner with a some a male with lived experience to inform your decisions and to help you pick out imagery. And I think to a point, right? That's we need to have that. Otherwise, we're dragging, you know, this this male survivor in front of the lens of someone who doesn't really, um, who could never understand fully yeah. their their needs, right? Yeah. But I think more importantly, it your your outreach, your messaging that really speaks to the culture of the organization. If we look at our organizations and at different levels, organizations, small and bar, whatever that looks like, do we have male representation informing any of these decisions? And if not, how informed are those decisions going to be? And I always go back. I definitely, I, one of the, the comparisons, um, parallels are with other underserved communities and, you know, the countries, I think we're coming a long way with addressing some of the mistakes of the past, but, Mm-hmm. investing resources to ensure that um, communities of color, for instance, for one example, are more represented, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. If we just went to our website and put a stock photo of a black person, how authentic is that response, right? Mm-hmm. The a best practice then um, held by, believed by some, believed by many, is that we include those voices within the organization, whether that's a board director, whether it's an advisory council, whether that's just a working group, you're More than just adding, you know, the, the picture. So there's, you know, just like, yeah. And you said it perfectly, you know, we're still a long way from educating society in general on what human trafficking, commercialized violence is. And we're having conversations like this on those nuances. It's like, holy gosh, that's, it's tough. It is. Well, and I hope, I, I kind of hope like that people listening or watching kind of their mind is blown because you know, I, I think that um, people get passionate about this and sort of want to hop in and yeah. come up with solutions and yeah. let me do this. I mean, this was me, you know, uh, 13 years ago or 12 years ago. But I think that, you know, we owe, we owe one of the, uh, you know, most vulnerable populations of people our time to learn. Yeah. And so I hope our minds are blown with some of this information because there's so much more yeah. to to grasp and to understand and to research and to learn. You said something that um, that I wanted to talk about. That's like, you kind of phrase it like typology. So talk about sextortion, talk, talk about like the digital era we're in and sort of what parents can do even. We can get to that too. Yeah, absolutely. There are, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think when we're you know going back to what people, you know, when you say human trafficking, what their mind goes to what they've been educated basically i think it's just been the more visible with you know say for instance pimp facilitated trafficking or online with that you know um child sexual abuse imagery i think i will agree that that typology or that form that dynamic happens more is more common with certain demographics 
there with online sexual exploitation, child sexual abuse imagery and material, um, familial based, so familial based, but using online channels, um, mm -hmm. there are um, typologies that are more common from, from what we know today that are affect um, our, our, our boys and male youth significantly. So the sextortion term that came out a couple a couple of years ago, if even if I don't even know if it's that long, where uh, predators will um, they will recruit or scour social media, try to build relationships with uh, with young men, boys and young men. This the grooming process. The cycle is this is mirrors that of anyone else. Yeah. They reach out. They find something on social media that they, they can use to build further build that relationship. What we're seeing with with, um, with with young men, boys and young men, is that predators will find stuff on their social media, including phone numbers and or gaming systems. So they build that network. They will create fake personas of a of a woman and or or depending on who the guy is or, or a gay a gay person, mm -hmm. and um, they'll send initially the what we've seen is they send a nude photo in the beginning. So they'll send a, a naked photo of a woman, right, or video. And then they will use that to encourage to build further that relationship, create this bond, the secret bond. Mm -hmm. And then they will ask the boy to send um, to send a picture of them naked. Right. And so once that's done, then they use that and say, you're going to send me more naked photos or videos or you're going to meet with me for sex or or give me money. Or I'm going to tell your mom and dad, I'm going to blast this all over social media. I'm going to sit, share it with your friends. I'm going to share it with your hockey team. I'm going to share it with your football coach. I'm going to share it with your girlfriend. And that's what that exploitative process. There's a, there was a really big case out of Wisconsin. I, I'm not quite sure where it was. There was 150. This predator had, had sextorted or ex, uh, exploited 150 boys from UK and America. The outcome of that, Lindsay, you can imagine – Taking into consideration all of those things we just talked about, about, you know, fear of being outed, fear of being gay, fear of my, you know, the, being kicked out of the church, all of those things. These boys kill themselves. These mm -hmm. boys commit suicide mm -hmm. um, because of this exploitation. And it's not uncommon for these same perpetrators to then sell those those images and those videos online and on the dark web. So that's mm -hmm. one of the channels of um, the typologies that that we see common with this population you know, I say digital, you know, because it's hard to just define all that. That can be yeah. or texting. Work with guys that were trafficked by women on pl plenty of fish, um, as well as these gay dating sites. We lost you for about five seconds. You said that could be texting and what else? So texting and um, so apps, internet, the dark web, but and I always, you know, you talk about gay, uh, gay dating sites, the mainstream dating sites. I've worked with the, um, with a guy who was, who was trafficked by a woman on Plenty of Fish. I've worked with guys who were trafficked on Adam for Adam, Grinder, and Silver Daddy. Mm -hmm. So, and it's really, there's definitely, I think the value in knowing where the spaces and the channels where this is going on is valuable so that you can um, conduct outreach. And if, if you're a law enforcement person, that's that you have a different role in that, obviously. But what's really cool about a lot of these sites, Lindsay, is that nonprofits and public health professionals, you can pay for broadcast advertising and outreach campaigns, geo-specific to oh, a zip, zip code in a region. And that's a lot of what the HIV prevention and some of the public health um, organizations have done to, um, to increase, yeah, to increase identification. So those, those, are the, those are the most common that I've seen, and I, I want to go back to the, the, the three models that we've seen with, with boys and men, mm -hmm. familial, the street family, and then pimp facilitated. Familial, um, the street family, and pimp. And, and then as pimp, okay. pimp facilitated. Are you familiar with the Victor Rax case out of Utah? No. So this was, uh, Jane Anderson um, is going to be doing a webinar on this, but Victor Rax was a, a, a gang leader, a heterosexual. He was a Hispanic gentleman from Guatemala, I believe was in Utah, was operated the head of a gang, and he would recruit um, Hispanic male youth from these marginalized communities into the gang. That was, that was the street family. Okay. And what they found out is that he would lure them to a secret place, sex, sexually assault, rape them, and then use the fear of telling people about that sexual assault or that they initiated it 
to then force those boys into labor trafficking, selling drugs, selling arms. So, you know, across the spectrum, if we're looking, the same seedy dynamics, greed, yeah. that lead to the exploitation of any person affects this population. I just think, I think part of it's we're not, we're not asking the right questions. Some of us have been normalized, not even see it's not even on our radar. And with, you know, with, um, you know, best in class leaders, thought leaders, yourself and others that are having the courage to have conversations like this, sharing space, I mm -hmm. think we're seeing movement. I think more and more people are learning and more law enforcement and our prosecutorial partners are, are tuning in. So it's awesome. I totally agree. Well, and I just think that, yeah, just, just to think about how far we've come as a movement. Um, it's a real sure. honor to, you know, to watch and, and still be a part of it. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's encouraging to, to know that sometimes when I'm somewhere and tell them what I do, they actually have a little bit of an idea of what that means. Yeah. Um, okay, so someone asked something and it was something I was gonna ask. So can you speak to parents? I would say like on a general level, but also even like for, those who have boys like are there any what what words of wisdom would you give i know you're a parent yourself i'm an uncle not a parent i'm an uncle, oh, you're an uncle. sorry niece and nephew yeah no worries yeah. i wish not not yet <laughs> not yet Lindsay. <laughs> Woof. um i would say let me talk to um to the dads so to anybody first right so more often than not i have heard so um boys who were sexually who were trafficked for sex, sexually abused, assaulted. And I'm not going to say more often than not, I misspoke. Many times I hear this from boys that they were afraid to tell anyone because they didn't think they want their dad to think that they were weak or they didn't want to disappoint their dad. And this is the truth for moms. But we have to, we have, we know that there's this bond, right, with the dad and the son. Um, yeah. And so if you're a dad and you're listening, have a direct, super cool, open conversation before your kid goes to bed tonight and you let them know that there's nothing that would, that could happen to them that would ever change your love for them. And I would also say the words, say sexual abuse, say sexual harm, say these things by name. So it moves some of that, that shame and secrecy and taboo off even saying the word, mm. but also to moms, I was a mama's boy and there was definitely this relationship. And so many times again, I think, you know, we talk about the birds and the bees and we have these conversations. We need to be more direct, more frank and transparent. These, the, the, I mean, there's horrible things happen to, to our, our kids when we're not, I think we're not comfortable talking about that. So we got to take the stickiness out of that. And I would say tonight, if you're a mama, go home and have a conversation with, with your son. Let them know without a shadow of a doubt that um, it's not ever going to change your love, that it's yeah. safe. And, and really, and I would say more than just a one-off conversation, have, create a space in the house where it's okay to talk about these things and we're removing that stickiness out of it. Um, I, I would that. say in general, there's, I don't, we should be monitoring our, um, you know, social media. Yeah. And I think there's different, you know, there's beliefs at what level and all of that. Um, sometimes, and I'm not a parent, so I don't want to, I don't want to seem inauthentic. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, I don't know if that works. I think what's, I think the perfect or a powerful combination is creating a safe space where parents are having tough conversations. They're creating a safe space for disclosure or even before that, just to build trust, right? Mm -hmm. Also, there's a level of accountability and responsibility and oversight of the, of the things that your kids are, are tuning into, but also the real need. And I think I saw that in the in the, uh, in the chat, the prevention education in schools, right? Mm. The combination of all that, because like yeah. you said, you tell me not to do something, guess what I'm gonna do when, as soon as you walk around the corner, right? Yeah. So there are, and we know that there are several <clears throat> evidence-based, gender-inclusive prevention education curricula out there. I think here's, here's the caveat with that, right? I know here in Florida, I'm not sure about in Texas, but it's now mandated that every school, I think uh, middle, and, uh, middle school and high school has to have prevention education. Here's where we're falling short. There's no oversight to ensure that just as many boys are being, imp being exposed or that curriculum is being ex delivered to just as many boys as girls. Interesting. That's not fair mm. um, because we know that the risks at that, especially at younger ages, is just as high. Interpol tells us that 
the most severe online sexual exploitation happens to boys. Mm. So, and again, not a, not a worse, it's not worse than the others or us versus them. It's just our boys are just as at risk as our girls. And so that's not just to be going into school and not providing the same level of prevention or tools to protect myself um, based on the gender. And I'll, you know, I'll follow or I'll finish that, you know, that comment with one other thing. I think the more that the community becomes educated on what this is, the more that they become aware of those who are funded and who are charged in the community with protecting our kids in addition to them, nonprofits, teachers, school districts in particular, if I was the parent of a boy that was trafficked out of a school and I found out that there was a curriculum that was delivered to girls and that mm -hmm. was not to boys, I'd feel some way about that. And I don't know what that looks and I don't want to scare anybody. I think it's just sure. a really, I think it might be an uncomfortable conversation, but a necessary something for yeah. us to think about, just like, as you said, as we're evolving, um, we need to have, you know, have the humility to do better. And yes. it's unrealistic as from an operational standpoint for say my organization, when I led previously or whoever to do everything in house, it's irresponsible. Yeah. It's, it's just not the way we do things, yeah. which again goes to support that partnership and collaboration and making sure that you have partners, you have direct linkages with providers who have experience yes. um, serving all of that. On that, I keep going on that, uh, Lindsay. And on that that yep. point, I just want to circle or to finalize that piece of it is, um, you know, the misconception around sexual orientation and male victimization. So we're seeing a lot of the providers linking with LGBTQ youth, youth serving providers. Oh yeah, I remember you talking to me about this, Alex. Yeah, and it's imp I mean that's important because I think LGBTQ youth are disproportionately represented. Um, within vulnerable populations such as those experiencing homelessness. But the majority, if you're looking at the numbers of male victims and survivors, don't identify as LGBTQ youth. Mm. Um, the same with C-sex, the same with sexual abuse. The majority identifies heterosexual or bisexual. Mm. And so we have to be really careful referring someone that doesn't identify as gay or bisexual to an LGBTQ youth serving organization. And here's why we know that so many times there are these feelings of shame and stigma and, oh my God, because I was trafficked or because I was abused, it made me gay. Or I've just been trafficked by a ring of six gay men and now you're gonna send me to this organization. Just the mere appearance, or the, just seeing a rainbow flag can be, can be incredibly triggering. So I just wanna make sure that we're thinking at all the way through to make sure yeah. that the needs of all of these boys are met powerful perspective that I think that, again, if we jump into quick solutions, you know, yeah. you know, trying to help, I think you, you forget, you know, or you don't know. Yeah. Um, just all the complexities that go along and all the considerations. And I mean, to, to what you said earlier about kind of messages to parents. I think the other thing I'd add with that, if you're wanting to know, I, I saw a couple of people who asked about prevention education in schools. Um, if you're a parent, ask for it. Because um, yeah. we've had, it's, it's slowly kind of getting into schools here and there, depending on what curriculum and what school district, all these things here in Texas. But um, we've had districts in the past, we, we don't do prevention education anymore, but we used to. And we would have um, you know, good school districts in the past, they would tell us that they weren't interested in it because it would create a PR problem. Because if they had this curriculum, mm -hmm. they, then of course that might show that like the parents think that this is happening here. And right. so districts and, and principals or whoever, you know, uh, they need to hear from parents to say like, no, we think this is important for our kids to have. They're gonna listen to you a lot better than they're gonna listen to a random organization that comes right. in, I wanna present, you know, yeah. to your so, and I love what you said about build relationship. It, your kids are not going to, you know, they're going to go the opposite way when you say, don't look at that. Yeah. But going to talk to you if you create a relationship and create an open dialogue about hard stuff. Yeah. And, and then I think monitor. I still talk to some yeah. friends parents now who say, I don't know, you know, what my kid's on or what she's doing on that app. I'm like, 
You need to know. <laughs> yeah. You need to know. Absolutely. <laughs> you need to know. And so I think that that's like, uh, we can't, I, I, I pray um, parents don't get to the point where you're just so overwhelmed because of all the new social stuff and iPads and this and that and apps that, that we just turn the blind eye and yeah. just, you know, not know what's going on. I think that that's, it's too important uh, not to learn. So yeah. Up your bootstraps and learn it. Uh, <laughs> exactly, good stuff. So I want to I want to geek out just a little bit on what you're doing now because I the, I wrote down a couple things that you were saying the other day um, about public health and violence as a disease. Mm -hmm. I just think that's fascinating. Tell everybody, and then we'll we'll pop to some Q and A before we leave here. Yeah, so I've really embraced this. You know human trafficking is a form of violence. And so the CDC and others have really done a lot of work on violence, doses of trauma violence, as, a, as, a, as a disease, as a pandemic of violence. And when you approach it through that lens, you can, um, you can codify it. So you can see what the root causes of it. A medical or a health term would be the etiology. So the root causes and the cumulative risks that lead to, to that. But we see that in the public health space where, you know, whether it's sexual assault, child trafficking, gang violence, intimate partner violence, as a form of violence. And so the good news is that mm. it more closely aligns with the ecological framework in this public health space, social determinants of health, where you can identify uh, social determinants of health or health risks that lead to later exploitation. But the value in that is that you can also identify um, protective or promotive mechanisms that can buffer against those risks at each level. And so that, prevent, that public health uh, framework looks at uh, preventing and it's preventing at three levels. So there's primary prevention would be, you know, uh, policies, legislation, education in schools, secondary prevention, which many would um, know as intervention. So that's preventing it from further occurring further victim identification, screening protocols, street outreach, and then tertiary prevention, which would be make uh, restoring and empowering uh, the survivor to ensure that there's a, they sustain themselves out of the life. So they're, they're, they don't, there's no relapse or recidivism. And, and the, I think the, the value of that again, Lindsay, is that when you approach it through that public health framework, you can draw on best practices and other models for preventing other forms of violence that have been successful, gang violence, mm -hmm. uh, intimate partner violence, domestic violence. There's a lot of research and there's a huge, there's, there's a lot more evidence an evidence base within the public health space around sexual exploitation, commercial sexual exploitation than there is currently in victim services and criminal justice. So there's a lot of value in, in that, in that approach to prevention. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just think that that's, that's cool. Yeah. When you compare it to intimate partner violence and all these other types of violence to try to put it more in there instead of that, like you said, kind of that criminal justice yeah. lane, it opens up um, some data, I would think, and just yeah. read on how it can relate. I'm very curious how that's going to look moving forward, you know, in the movement and where some of these things land, even within the states and uh, within the Fed, the federal system, you yeah. know? Well, um, and two, when you're at that criminal justice framework, by definition, you're looking at a victim, right, or, or, or several victims, that public health framework kind of shifts us from that portrait view to a landscape view and identifies the, the adverse community environments in addition to the ACEs, adverse uh, child experiences, but also populations that are at higher risk so mm -hmm. that you can develop targeted, more targeted interventions for populations at risk instead of waiting till somebody's victimized and saying, oh my gosh, how could we have prevented that? Yeah. Or where do we put this person now? That's super cool. Oh, I yeah. love I love geeking out. Okay, so let's answer some questions. Um, gosh, so many, okay, we talked about what's being done to teach kids in schools. Um, everyone needs to know school stuff. I'm working, I'm working. I saw a good one here. I can see the way we see victims suffering is shaped by disease health view. How does the public health perspective you're describing impact how we see bad guys, victimizers and bystanders? Well, I think it, we were able to see 
um, violence as a disease. And we're able to see, we're able to look at this as a victim as any, anyone who goes through something bad needs, needs assistance. I think so many times, I think an align with this question is, for instance, if we see a heterosexual um, 15 year old guy, right, who appears in our emergency room, he's the last who's with a gunshot, for instance. Our minds go everywhere except to ask him if you've been, how did this happen to you? Many times they're the perpetrator. There can never be a victim. Mm -hmm. And again, going back to this public health framework on the root causes or the adverse community environments that, um, that that person is living in and the associated risk, the associated levels of violence that are associated with that or, or that go along with that. I think it puts us in a better position or a different light to, again, look at this as a form of violence, mm. as opposed to the perfect victim or the perfect pep uh, perpetrator and these stereotypes around who can be a victim and a perpetrator. Again, mm. when you look at where did this young person, what's their community like? Did they experience the same adverse child experiences, racism, microaggression, gender bias, homophobia, transphobia, lack of access, all of those social determinants that we know are disproportionately um, provided or, or um, experienced by underserved populations. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a different framework and it allows us to move away from that. Who's, what, who's the perfect victim to really these populations that are vulnerable mm -hmm. um, to various forms of violence? It widens the net in a good way. It's, yeah. yeah. And again, that, that landscape, that kind of landscape view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's so, so cool to think about. Yeah, it just kind of, kind of blows my mind thinking on that, that macro level. Um, I've got a question for you, Free, and if anyone else has anything, feel free to put it in the chat. But if you were to say kind of to the, the anti-trafficking movement as a whole, in this field to address um, the topic that we've been talking about today? Like what would be kind of the one thing you're like, if we could just move the needle a little bit by doing this, we could, we could, you know, get to a better place. Like, what would you say it is? This is just like a bonus. <laughs> I think the leaders within the movement who at whatever NGO systems that at the state level, those who have, um, those who have influence, put it out there, and whatever they look like, whatever organization, the leaders who are driving the movement now, if we could just all come around the table in an organized way with the cultural humility enough to say, we got some stuff wrong. Mm -hmm. How can we make it right? Mm -hmm. It is not difficult to pull out numbers, disaggregated numbers around the various, the, the comorbidities, the things that... Um, boys and young men experience as a result of trafficking and trauma. So if we're not seeing, if we're not disclosing, if we're not seeing these high identification rates, okay, well, let's look different approach. How does, what are the after effects of trauma? Incarceration, substance dependency, overdose, suicide, violence. We can see how many, we can see the prevalence of that within, within communities across the country, Texas, Florida, if we take the time to look, if we make it a priority, and I just don't think it's been prioritized. Mm -hmm. Lindsay, you know, there are a couple of ways that I, I, I think about that question. And I, you know, I'm a patriot and you know, I look at, you know, my country, I love, I love my country. And over the, we've had to confront some things in our past in order to make us better. Mm -hmm. And I always think of the strength-based approach, right? There are a lot of th good things about the United States and we've made some mistakes as a country. We are never going to get better unless we have, as a whole, the courage to look at those things, accept them, take responsibility, and say, okay, how can we do better? Me as a person, right? Through my journey, there have been a lot of shortcomings, a lot of character defects. There's been a lot of challenges. And it doesn't really matter the trauma or you know, where, where it came from. The fact remains that I made some mistakes. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of good things about me today. And I, I'm a great, you know, an advocate today, but there came a point where I had to accept responsibility for, for where I fell short, mm. um, be accountable, and then commit to myself, how do we do better? How can I draw upon, 
know, the strengths that I have to be a better person? How can the United States draw upon the strengths that it has to be a better country? How can the movement, the movement needs to acknowledge where it fell short mm. or where it didn't meet the mark. And I don't want to say it in a negative way, right? Sure. There are so many, I'm looking, I'm, I'm talking with a thought leader, right? And there are people that you have fallen, uh, that are following you today that are, are, are thought leaders. They're committed, they're, they're, they want to do the right thing. Um, but we can do better. And I think we have to come to the table. We have to, we all have to agree that the life of one child is no more or less valuable than the life of the other, regardless of their gender identity. Mm. Um, and realize that children across the gender spectrum experience horrible um, types of trauma and adverse child experiences that they had no choice in. Mm. And as a result, many times, the, again, the cumulative effect of all that leads to exploitative situations, trafficking, and other forms of victimization. The unfair part of all of that is that there are almost zero places for these boys to reach out to. Hmm. Going through life, having been experienced, you know, having experienced one of the most heinous crimes known to mankind or humankind, I'm sorry, and just feeling like nobody's there, nobody's listening. Hmm. Um, that's, that's heartbreaking. Um, as, a, as, a faith, as a faith person, as a believer, um, and, you know, within the faith community, there are so many kids that identify as LGBTQ or that are going through the process are trying to figure it out, who've been kicked out to the street because of that, who are going through walking those streets thinking that there isn't a God who loves them, there isn't a higher power who loves them, there's not a community who loves them. Mm -hmm. And in many communities, there's, there's a church on every corner. We can do better. Yeah. yeah. We as, you know, we can do better, but we've all got to have the willingness to come around the table and say, you know what, guys, we're not leaving this table till we have a plan, an actionable plan. We don't know what it looks like, short, medium, long term, but by God, we're not going to have the same conversation next year, next January. You know. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's it's like um, vulnerability and accountability. It's like okay, let's all get where no one's the savior here. Okay, we're all yeah. we've all. Um, stumbled, um, we've learned from our mistakes, but let's come together and say, like, how can we do better? And in a movement, I mean, like you said at the beginning, I mean, this movement's 21-ish years old here, especially here in the U.S. We have a long way to go, and we don't know everything. And yeah. I was just a grant narrative earlier today on questions. I'm like, I've been doing this a long time. I don't know the <laughs> questions. <laughs> I'm like, oh, but I mean, that's, that's the nature of this is yeah. we've got to continue growing and be comfortable with the, the uncomfortability of not, yeah. knowing, you know, and, yeah. and listening, I think is, is a big thing that I think is played in well in this movement in the last, I would even say five years. I think that we're getting better at listening to experts and um, falling on our sword when we need to fall on it. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. Gosh, that's so good, man. Well, we are um, going to wrap up, but I'm super grateful. Yeah, just to just to listen to you uh, share your heart and your thoughts and just kind of the brilliant mind in there about all of this. Hopefully it challenged some of you guys on um, just even some different language that you haven't heard of and and just recognizing it's there's more that meets the eye. Uh, a friend of mine says there's always more to the story. And I think that that's probably what we learned today for sure but thank you so much nathan um thank you fun. Lindsay. i really appreciate you elevating the issue continue doing the great work it's really an honor thank you my friend thanks all right bye you guys bye-bye